Hello. Thanks for coming. I'm Pontus, and this is a talk about Diagrammer, which is a diagramming tool that I made for Brilliant. Brilliant is a company that makes online STEM lessons that teach concepts in science, technology, engineering, and math. And these lessons are bite-sized. You can do them on your phone. They, uh, you can learn some new concept in just like five minutes. And the explanations are intuitive. Uh, we have great teachers uh, who have worked hard to get the concepts across to you in a way that makes sense. Uh, and importantly, the lessons are active. You're answering questions and you're solving problems. You're forced to think about the concept so that you really learn it. And part of making this possible to do this bite-sized intuitive teaching online is through the use of diagrams. These can be everything from gear smashing, uh, schedule, a uh, picture of a bridge with the trusses, uh, heat flow when you're cooking. And a uh, quick show of hands, who in this room in the past week has drawn a technical diagram like this to explain something to a colleague or a friend or something? It's quite a few. How many of you, keep your hands up, how many of you uh, did that using a computer? few less. How many of you did that using code, writing code? Not that many. Okay. Uh, I think this will be interesting to all of you because I think m most of you know how to code. Um, so let me tell you about Brilliant's journey to making diagrams by writing code. A few years ago, uh, Brilliant was using conventional tools that you would as an engineer or a scientist that people are used to, like Python's matplotlib is something that many have used. Uh, Mathematica is a common tool in um, academia. And also um, 3D software like Cinema 4D, which was used to make this awesome animation of a uh, cube turning into a, I don't know what that is really, uh, <laughs> trun truncated icosahedron or something. Uh, <laughs> And uh, there are some problems with this. When you use an external tool, you uh, export it into a static format, like an image or a video file, and then you can't really do anything more with it. And also, as you can see on the slide, um, the style is not really consistent, and you can almost tell where things are coming from. Uh, and it doesn't really feel uh, like it's a whole. So Brilliant uh, made some internal tools specifically plotting and graphing tools for um, you know, drawing the graph of a function or plotting some scatter points uh, or making a bar chart. And uh, this is great for plotting, but plotting isn't diagramming. It's not the same thing. Diagramming is more than that. Um, on the right here, we have a diagram of the forces acting on a glass and a tablecloth as you pull the tablecloth out from under the glass. And there's a picture of a person shouting, and while some of the air is cooler than the rest of the air, and seeing how the sound waves propagate differently through different media. And these aren't just plotting of data on a grid. But most tools are made for that, and that was the truth for a Brilliance tool as well. And so here I'm showing you just one of these ambitious uh, diagrams and what the authoring tool looked like for that. It's a huge uh, mass of forms and, let me play that again, uh, and like injected JavaScript and stuff that you had to deal with. It was really like we were outgrowing this, this plotting uh, paradigm for making diagrams. So it was clear that there was a need for better diagramming. And this is where Diagrammer comes in. So what is Diagrammer? It is a tool for that where you write Elm code and we generate a diagram. Quite simple. Next, I'm going to show you, give you a quick tour uh, and make this simple geometric diagram uh, to get you a f give you a feel for what it's like. And you know, it's strange loop. We have to have some code in the talk. Um, so let's start with the simplest, base, most basic shape. It's a circle of radius one with a solid stroke. Um, nothing complicated. Let's add another shape. Let's add a triangle. Um, it's a regular polygon with side count three, so we get an equilateral triangle. 
um, also with a solid stroke, and then we're putting both of them in a list and then stacking them on top of each other so that we get the triangle on top of the circle. But we wanted to make a little row of things, right? So let's move the triangle over to the side. I guess I should point that way. Um, by using the translate function on the regular polygon here. So that means we're translating it by the ve vector that points two units in the x direction, so to the right. Now, we were going to do this with a bunch of polygons, so I'm, I'm switching the circle out for you know, a triangle and then a square, both using that regular polygon function. And I'll keep going. I'll make the first four of these, um, triangle, square, pentagon, and hexagon. And it's starting to get a little messy. Uh, it's starting to feel a little repetitive. You might start to feel your um, programming brain turn on. Uh, in fact, you know, these are doing the same thing, but there's a parameter here. So let's write a function. And we'll write the function, uh, pull out the, the common stuff, and now we can just say poly 3, 4, 5, 6. And it's much clearer what's going on. We can also see that there's a pattern in the translations I've done where I'm translating by 0, then 2, 4, 6. So you might be tempted to put that in the function too, but I have a better way of doing this. Um, instead of stacking these objects, we can use the function row and give, um, give the list to the row function with a certain spacing. And now we don't even have to worry about the translation. It'll just put the, the geometric shapes in a row. How does this work? Well, we can turn on a debug command of sorts by mapping the function show bounds and origin over these. So now you can see the bounding box for each object and the sort of alignment point of each of them. And you can see that that's in the center of that regular polygon. And they're aligned on that center line. But it kind of doesn't look that good. We want them to sort of be sitting on a table. That feels more natural. And so there's a function for that. Who would have known? Uh, <laughs> it's called align. And so we align to the bottom. And now that alignment point moves to the bottom. It was at the center. Now it's at the bottom. And now they all line up at the bottom. And when I use the function row here to put all these in one row, uh, or when I was using stack before, that creates another diagram. Just like you know, you, when you, if you're familiar with HTML or SVG, you create a bunch of divs, and then you put them in a div, and then you put that in a div, and everything's a div. Here, everything is a diagram. So all of these are diagrams, and I'm making a diagram out of them. And I can show you that by adding this debug function to the full thing. So I moved it from acting on each of them to acting on the full thing. And now you can see the bounding box of the full thing. Let's make another row of things. So first, I'm going to call what we have so far row 1. And then I'm going to create a row 2 where we keep the sequence going. So polygon 7, 8, 9, and 10. I'm not going to pronounce the Greek names for those. Um, and then these are just two diagrams. We can do the same thing that we did before. We can put them in a list, and then we have a column function, of course, so that we can put them one on top of the other. And so that way, you know, we're almost there. Uh, the only thing that is left is a splash of color. And our polygon function we had before, we can add another parameter to it and fill the shapes with that color uh, in addition to stroking them. Um, I'm not going to show you exactly what the full code looks like. I think you can imagine. Um, but that's a like, very quick introduction to what it's like working in Diagrammer. Before I move on, I'm going to talk, summarize what we've seen so far and talk a little bit about building blocks. So we saw some building blocks for creating diagrams from scratch. Circle, square, regular polygon. There's more stuff like a general polygon where you can give it any number of points. There's a rectangle, etc. There's also a way to include an image or include text. There are a few more. And then, so all of these are diagrams, like I said. Um, and then there are these functions, stack, row, and column. We saw all of them that you use to combine them. And there's really only these three, basically. Um, and then there are ways to work with them, to transform them, Translating, scaling, rotating, familiar to most people. There's also basically just these two functions in addition to row and column for doing layouts. 
um, alignment, which you saw, and then padding for adding some extra padding to things. And then there's uh, some ways of controlling visibility, uh, opacity, and mask. And that's it. Like, this is the core that, for all the like, diagrams you saw in my attract mode animation coming in, all of those are made by just using these simple tools. But we also, we, we're working in Elm. We have a programming language at our disposal. So let's see what that can give us beyond just making this static image. I'm going to make the Sierpinski triangle. I'm sure most of you know this. This is a fractal. It has multiple levels. It starts with just a triangle, equilateral triangle. And then you make holes in whatever triangles are left. Uh, and you can keep going forever. Um, we're not going to do that. But we're going to go a few levels down. So I'm going to define Sierpinski 0, which is the, you know, the base level of the Sierpinski triangle. And it's what we saw before. It's just an equilateral triangle. We create it the same way we did before. And then I'm going to start constructing Sierpinski 1 by using the primitives that we've already seen. I'm going to put two of them together in a row, now with a zero spacing so that they touch each other. And then I'll combine the base with another Sierpinski 0 triangle and put them in a column. And now I've created the next level of the Sierpinski triangle. For uh, purposes of uh, seeing patterns, I'm going to take this base uh, definition here and move it, like remove that variable and move that code into Sierpinski 1 here um, so that we can see that Sierpinski 1 is now completely defined in terms of Sierpinski 0. And now if we want to go to Sierpinski 2, all we do is increment these numbers. We just define, we have Sierpinski 1 in terms of 0 up there, and then do we define Sierpinski 2 in terms of Sierpinski 1? Uh, and we can keep going. Sierpinski 3 in terms of Sierpinski 2. And at this point, our programming brains are turning on. And we're like, there's a pattern. I want to exploit this pattern. Um, and we can do that by writing a recursive function. So we're adding a parameter depth. Uh, and if the depth is 0, then we'll just default to the simple triangle. Otherwise, we'll define it in terms of the lower depth Sierpinski triangle. So Sierpinski 2 is going to be based on Sierpinski 1, Sierpinski 1 on Sierpinski 0, and so on. And now we can call this function with 0. We get the 0th Sierpinski triangle, Sierpinski 1, 2, and 3, and so on. Um, this is great, right? That was very simple. Um, but there's something that it fe it feels like you can go further, because this is a computer doing this work. Um, and while I, as the programmer can change these numbers and get different things to show up. I want the user who is trying to learn something in this lesson to be able to explore these different levels for themselves. And here's, in fact, how, uh, how it works in Diagrammer. You have a definition diagram that is like your top level definition. But it is not a static object. It's, it has, it's a function that takes a parameter. Uh, and this parameter, the input parameter, is kind of a, a bit of a magic parameter. Uh, you set it up elsewhere, uh, and then you can access things that you've set up. So I can set up a depth slider and substitute that in for the three, the static three I had before, and voila, I get a slider, and I can slide between the different levels of the Sierpinski triangle. So at its core, what you're working on when you're working in Diagrammer is you're writing this function from this magical input value to a diagram. And we talked a bunch about what a diagram is. Um, everything is a diagram, and then you compose diagrams out of diagrams. Um, but what is the input? Well, there are a few different kinds. I'm just going to show you three of them, but you can imagine more. Um, here's a slider, just what we saw. Uh, but applied to a bunch of graphs on a Cartesian plane. Here is a locator, which is like a slider, but it's on top of the diagram, and it's 2D, which means we can do things like here, controlling the position and velocity of a little astronaut who then uh, goes around the Earth in an orbit, if we set them just right. And then there's ways of controlling time and getting a time value in from this input. Um, here, through a stepper, where the learner can click on 
the arrows to go back and forth between individual steps and see the animation play out and get to sort of experience this animated explanation step by step at their own pace. Next, I want to talk a little bit about um, some considerations that went into designing Diagrammer. Uh, in particular, to ma making it simple and approachable for people. Um, I'm going to talk about functional programming and how that plays a role. I'm going to talk about making a learnable API and contrast it with other APIs that are less learnable. And I'm going to talk about curation, which is a, a principle that's been applied again and again in the design of Diagrammer. Let's start with functional programming. Let's talk about side effects. In, uh, I'm going to be harping a bit on imperative diagramming tools. Um, so uh, the most common ones, I think, are HTML canvas and P5.js or processing. In those, you, you have a function just like the diagram function. Uh, it's usually called draw. And in draw, you can draw things. You can draw a circle and another circle, super fun example. Um, and but the problem is you can also do things like you know, show an annoying pop-up, uh, scroll the user's browser, mine some Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> this is not great. Uh, it's not great from you know, a security standpoint or from like, just a QA standpoint, like not knowing what the hell is going to happen. Basically, anything can happen inside the draw function, even though it was just supposed to draw something. And people have to apply a lot of discipline to not misuse this. Um, in Diagrammer, since you're only writing this function, and it's an actual pure function, uh, it can only take this input and it can only output a diagram. It can't do anything else. The only thing it can do is make a diagram. And so try as I might, I get no side effects. I can only create those two circles and I can move them around and I can add some more stuff, but I can't break out of this very nice prison. <laughs> And we do this by using Elm, which is a pure functional language and can guarantee this kind of, um, yeah, it can guarantee no side effects. Um, uh, some other benefits of using Elm is that Elm is a simple language and that's what we wanted. We wanted something that has not that much going on so you don't have to learn that much and it's consistent and easy to understand. Uh, it's also great for its helpful error messages. Uh, a lot of you already know this. Next up, I want to discuss uh, the learnability of the API. Um, so of course, there are a bunch of functions and they need to be understandable. And there are a few ways to make them more easily understandable for people. Um, one of the ways is clarity over concision. Here's an example from P5 or HTML canvas, pick your poison, um, where we fill uh, 200, whatever that means. Uh, maybe we are filling 200 things, I don't know. And then we are making a circle with the numbers 3, minus 2, and 0.5. And a lot of you have maybe used this tool so you can guess what these mean, but you really have to guess. Like, there's nothing telling you what these things do, and you have to keep track of and remember uh, what all these random numbers do. So to contrast that with Diagrammer, we're very explicit. And you saw this before, but here's a Here's me doing exactly the same thing, but just in Diagrammer explicitly. I'm saying circle, I'm creating a circle with radius 5, 0.5, uh, and it's clearly the radius. In fact, while I was preparing this talk, I realized that this is actually wrong in P5 because that is not the radius. It is the diameter. And so I was making this mistake myself while I was making the talk. Um, but I, I went with it, and so let's pretend that it's the same thing. Uh, and then I'm filling with grayscale 200, which is, again, explicit about what that number 200 means. I mean, ideally, it would be something like a number between 0 and 1, I would say, but um, at least it's clear that it's going to spit out something grayscale, which is not at all clear from the other side. And then translating is its own thing. It's not baked into the function definition. You want to translate all of these objects when you're doing diagramming. And so baking that into every single function doesn't make that much sense. And when I look on the diagrammer definition, I can imagine what this looks like. I can imagine the circle uh, of radius 0.5 being filled with a certain color and then being moved over there. And I don't have to like keep a mental map of 
all of these particular parameters. I'm going to segue into talking about the right language, what I mean by that. Let's start with some examples. So here's another function from um, P5, I think, called triangle. It has six numbers. Okay, great. What do these numbers mean? Uh, <laughs> You could guess that it's like uh, coordinates, so it's x, y, x, y, x, y. It could also be x, 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 y, y, y. Oops, sorry. Um, it could also be like side lengths. I don't know. There's a triangle function here. Maybe that's what this is doing, or there's uh, angle um, measures. I don't know. The corresponding thing in Diagrammer uses the right language for the problem. It describes the points using a type, uh, a vector type. So v2, 3 minus 5 means a 2D vector. Um, or a point, uh, and then there are two other points, and so you can imagine that creating three points that we're gonna make a polygon out of. And you can also see that there's a list, and we're using the name polygon because why have the name triangle when this is a thing that you can generalize? And there's a, there's a shape to, to geometry that we want uh, apparent in our uh, functions and their type, their type signatures. And so looking at that, it's much easier for me to imagine what it's going to look like um, and figure it out. And so it's very easy for people to just see someone, someone else use this polygon function and immediately be like, oh, great, I know what it means. Here's another example. I'm using the same first four parameters, 3 minus 5, 2, and 10. So you might uh, guess that this means the same thing. It's like two points that define the ellipse. But no, it isn't. Uh, 3 minus 5 defines the center of the ellipse, but the 2 and 10 means how tall and how wide it is. Although I get, maybe I got that wrong. I think I got that wrong. Anyway, uh, they're, they're supposed to be flipped. Um, in Diagrammer, this is explicit, and we've even sort of broken it down and modularized it. So you start by creating a circle, and then you stretch that circle. Um, and then you translate it. So sort of breaking things down into their geometric components. And this way, by learning about translate, by learning about stretch, you're, giving, you're getting more tools in your toolbox that you can use in more situations, and you don't have to keep learning a long list of individual commands. It also has the ad added benefit, if you don't make the mistake I did, and flip up X and Y, that you can uh, give it a different vector and stretch the ellipse in other directions. Otherwise, you have to resort to sort of figuring out what angle you need to stretch it in, uh, and working with vectors is just more natural. In fact, I argue that uh, vectors are like crucial to geometry and diagramming, and it's kind of flummoxing uh, <laughs> that so many, so many graphics and diagramming libraries force you to work with coordinates when vectors is the right language for the job. Um, and so Diagrammer has a nice vector library, a vector type, and that's like a core type, um, and uh, uses it to in the type definitions to make everything clear. Uh, same thing with, you've seen translate, rotate, and scale in many contexts, but figuring out how to give these like human approachable way, it, it, by writing these functions, we make it approachable for humans to think about geometry and think about transforming space, which often feels like an afterthought and feels like you're supposed to like add the x coordinates together and then multiply to do what really is, I'm moving the diagram over here and I'm making it bigger, right? Um, and so making this really core to the language of, of, of diagramming uh, is, I think, the right way to do it. Another thing that Diagrammer uh, does different from the imperative um, diagramming tools is it doesn't have a hidden state. And so I'm going to explain what I mean by first drawing a circle, and then, hey, I want a yellow circle a little further down. And maybe I'm making a traffic light or something. And OK, let's give me one of those first circles again. I'm writing the same code, right? But it's yellow. Why is it yellow? Um, if you've ever used one of these, you know why it's yellow. It's because the fill function is not really a function. It's, it's a procedure that sets some hidden global state somewhere. Uh, and now that carries with you through the next whatever you do. Um, and contrast this with the very explicit uh, approach in Diagrammer and the sort of functional approach, 
where you, you keep saying what you mean, and it's always easy to trace where something came from. And you don't have to deal with this, suddenly someone said something somewhere else, and now my thing looks different. In fact, the worst thing that can happen here is someone in a previous function set scale to zero, and now everything just disappears, and you have no idea what's going on. You can't even like, easily debug it. OK, curation. So this is a theme in Designing Diagrammer um, about taking something that already exists. None of these ideas are very new, like this math has existed for centuries, uh, or been known to humans for centuries, I should say. Um, but take the right pieces and make something simple that's easy to learn and approachable. So Diagrammer uh, is heavily inspired by the Haskell library diagrams. Uh, which has tons and tons of good ideas in it about this kind of right language for describing graphics and diagrams. It has tons and tons of functionality, tons and tons of good ideas, but there's just a lot. And so what Diagrammer does is it picks out the, the small set of curated building blocks that you saw and sort of tries to make something where you can express yourself in many ways, maybe not all, maybe not as powerfully, but it's much more approachable. And so people can get started and can make something pretty quickly. Same thing with Elm. I said Elm is a simple language, that's true, but we're making it even simpler. We're sort of stripping it down, uh, not by removing functionality, but just not requiring you to know that functionality to get started making diagrams. So out of the uh, nine most common uh, types that you work with in Elm, we don't require you to know about those five. Only int, float, list, and string, and some of the geometry stuff that's crucial for diagramming. Elm also lets you, you know, define your own types and set up state, uh, create messages, and then pattern match on those messages to update the state. There's a whole Elm architecture that's great. We're not doing that. We're just doing this function from <laughs> input to diagram, and that's all you need to care about. Same thing with interactions. I showed you three. There's a few more, but there's not that many. And um, by limiting the number of interactions, authors making diagrams can make interactive diagrams without being UI designers and coming up with new ways of interacting. And this is great for uh, our learners, our users as well, because they don't have to learn new UI paradigms every time they go into a new lesson. They can just uh, see, oh, that's the familiar locator. That's a stepper. I know what to do. We've also curated the style. I did a little experiment and found some old uh, diagrams from before we had Diagrammer that were made in some random tool. And then I just remade them with default styles in Diagrammer. And they look a lot better. Uh, I didn't really have to do anything but use the, like, the default, the easiest way to do this and annotate things. And this is built upon uh, an art uh, style that has been developed at Brilliant. Um, with great colors that go well together, line widths that feel like they fit together, and fonts that, a small set of fonts, which is good practice, but we're encoding it in the diagramming library, so you can't choose whatever font you are like, and you don't have to think about that. And so people who otherwise feel, you know, aesthetically challenged can still make something that looks good. Let's talk about more benefits to, to using diagrams that's uh, in lessons online. One of them is position. Here's a diagram that was made before we had Diagrammer. And uh, it's maybe not readily obvious, but uh, this little plateau is supposed to line up with these ticks on the bottom, <laughs> and it doesn't. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's nitpicking, you know, when I do it in, in using code, it's easy to make them line up because I'm using a variable and I'm using it in both places and it's always going to match. But, and, and you, might, you might say, like, isn't that, was that really necessary? Um, but in fact, when you're teaching something, you really want to be right about things so people aren't confused about, like, what is your mistake and what is actually not true? Like, what, you need to be very uh, precise with truth. Patterns are an obvious thing, and they crop up a lot when teaching 
uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, here's a you know checkerboard and a few angles talking about the angle sum, uh, the exterior angle sum, and a little male robot as needs to go around this block. And there's some repetition. And for this, you know, writing code makes a lot of sense. Uh, we all know how to write a for loop or map over a list in the functional sense. Tactility is another one. Um, here's a diagram using that old uh, a plotting library that uh, wasn't intended for diagramming and, and sort of misusing it. Um, and it's nice. But you're dragging these sliders and like you really want to drag those blocks and think about like when it tips over. Like I don't want to drag this slider. It doesn't even like match up and s sort of I can s drag this and it moves at a different rate. Um, in Diagrammer, you can put these locators in the diagram and together with some extra visual flares and uh, feedback, like a little hand helping you out when it's going to tip, uh, you, you feel more like you can sort of see this in front of you and think about what would happen if I stacked some books and, and you might get excited to even try that yourself in real life. Consistency is also important when, when teaching. And in Brilliant Lessons, there is often static images to get you started thinking about something, some interactives or animations uh, about that same thing, uh, and then maybe some solutions or explanations uh, that go into more depth. Uh, and by writing, making these visuals using programming and uh, in, in Diagrammer, we get consistency because we can write a function that we can use over and over again. And if we want to change some parameters of the problem, you know, the solution also updates, and that animation also updates, and we don't have to go and re-export something somewhere else. Um, it gives us the ability to ask visual questions. A um, few years ago, uh, Brilliant was mainly using multiple choice questions, like A, B, C, D, uh, to get you through things and get you thinking about things. But now we can do things like ask you to plot some points and start creating a graph for someone who's learning about graphing for the first time. Uh, for someone learning about probability, we can give them some uh, intuition helping visuals, uh, visualizing the probability distribution and asking them questions about that uh, and getting at a more visual and intuitive sense for these subjects. We're also doing uh, block programming so a learner can create a little program here programming that little mail robot to go and deliver the mail. Um, the mail robot up here uh, is a diagram created in Diagrammer that visualizes the state of the program as the, uh, as the learner runs it. And, but because it is uh, a, using code to do these things, we can make many different diagrams. And so be depending on what kind of concept in programming we want to teach, uh, can use different visualizations and talk about a uh, vacuum a cleaning robot, a spell checker, or uh, do a histogram of a Mars mission and how long it took until the Mars lander failed. We can also let learners input algebra and then make diagrams based on that. The obvious one is plotting the expression. Um, but we can also do custom things, like this balance representation of simple uh, linear expressions for someone who's just learning algebra, and being able to take what they input and make it come to, come to life. All of these things are pretty cool to work on, uh, and Brilliant is hiring people. And you don't need to be like a graphical whiz or, any, whiz or anything. Um, you can work on the tools on the back end. There's a computer algebra system to work on. There's interpreters for that code stuff. Uh, there's you know, extending the diagramming toolkit. There's API design. There's a lot of stuff to do. If you're interested, you can reach out to me or go to Brilliant's website. Finally, I want to wrap up and sort of summarize what I've been talking about. Crucial takeaway is that diagrams are important for STEM communication, especially teaching, but otherwise too. And it's not the same as plotting. Many people use plotting, but would be better served by diagrams in certain scenarios. And maybe have to resort to paper because there is no computer tool at hand for making a diagram. 
um, that's precise. And diagramming goes hand in hand with functional programming, really fits well and is uh, joyful to use. And by curating and tailoring the tool to the specific use case and saying no to a lot of things, the tool can be much simpler and more approachable and therefore more successful. And then you can add stuff to it, but add the stuff you really need. And a well-designed tool that people like to use inspires creativity and people make just awesome stuff. Huge thanks to everyone at Brilliant for making so many cool things with Diagrammer. Uh, and all the stuff I've been showing you off today has been made by, by people at Brilliant. Um, I'm Pontus Granstrom. Thank you for coming to my talk.